Uh, hello, uh, very good evening to all the viewers. Uh, last time, Dr. Atri presented, uh, moderated a very good session on preparation for practicals. So he covered uh, in depth about the history and clinical examination. So today we'll be moving ahead to a table viva and we will cover uh, about the table viva in this today's webinar. So let me, uh, I, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. N.H. Krishna and Dr. Narayana Pradipa and our uh, uh, webinar moderator, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar Chinam Chetty, sir. So he has really uh, organized a very good platform and this platform has been there since last two and two to two and a half years. And it's been uh, delivered every week on Thursday without any stop. So that's really commendable job uh, on uh, CCI team. And thank you very much for giving all of us an opportunity to be a part of this webinar. So uh, today's uh, topic is preparation uh, for practical part two. Uh, today we have a panelist with us, Dr. Emma Chaudhary, Dr. Devasis Behra, Dr. Dipendra Kumar Rai, Dr. P. Arjun, and I'm your moderator, Dr. Mahesh Jansari. So I would take and I would take this an opportunity to introduce all of my panelists. Uh, so first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Imma Chaudhary. She's an MBBS and DNB chest. Presently, she's a professor and head at the Department of TB and Respiratory Diseases, Swarthi Medical College, Meerut. Dr. Devasis Vera is a MBBS, MD, DNB, and DM in Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine. He's an assistant professor at Department of Pulmonary Medicine at Kims Bhuneshwar. Dr. Dipendra Kumar Rai is an MBBS, uh, DNB chest and EDRM. He is an additional professor and head at the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Ames Patna, and he is also a chairman of Indian Chest Society, Bihar. Uh, Dr. P. Arjun Sir is an MBBS, MD, DTCT, DNB uh, from Government Medical College, Trivandrum. He is a FRCP as well, and he is a member of Nodal PMDT Committee for South Kerala as well. He's a senior consultant and head of the department and group coordinator at Department of Respiratory Medicine, Kim's Health, Tivendrum. Uh, Dr. P. Arjun uh, has been trained at uh, Asia Asthma Academy, Christ Church, New Zealand under Professor Richard Wesley. He was also trained in sleep medicine under Professor Colin Sullivan at Sydney, Australia. Uh, he has uh, undergone a training in interventional pulmonology under Professor Philippe Astol, Marcellus, France. And he has the areas of interest asthma, airway disease, non cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, sleep disorder, etc. etc. There are multiple publications to his credit, and he has authored chapters in three textbooks as well. And he's also an examiner for DNB respiratory medicine. And I'm your moderator, Dr. Mahesh Jansari. I'm MBBS, MD, and DNB, and presently I'm working as an assistant professor at Department of Pulmonary Medicine at KM Hospital, Mumbai. I'm also a national joint treasurer of Chase Council of India. So with this, uh, I would take an opportunity to start uh, today's webinar. That is a uh, preparation for practicals part two. So I welcome uh, all of our today's panelists. So I would begin uh, about the today's webinar with what is about the table viva. Table viva is usually the second half of the examination where after your clinical case presentation is over, there is a table viva and table viva consists of minimum arterial blood gases, pulmonary function test, polysomnography report. There are, are various drugs can be there, instruments can be there and various catheters can be put. Uh, most of the times, AB, all these reports are usually kept by the organizing department. However, there is a probability that the examiner can bring his ABG or interesting, uh, uh, interesting ABGs PFT from his collection for the examination. And instruments, there is a no end to an instrument. Manish, we have lost your voice. Even the ABG, spirometry, chest X-ray, or CT scan film, it is always preferable. It is always preferable uh, uh, 
um actually my net is not stable so i'll, I'll uh, switch off my video for a while i'm extremely sorry for that uh if it's abg biometry chest x ray and ct scan film it is always better to have a clinical background so with this uh, i'll start today's uh, question uh, i'll start today's uh, discussion uh, i have prepared a certain set of questions for all of our panelists and we will try to cover the as much as possible today in today's webinar so uh, my first uh, question uh, is for uh, means uh, my first question is for dr p arjun sir so uh, this is regarding the spirometry sir so what will you see on spirometry report for validity and what are the most important parameters to be read on the report thank you dr mahesh uh, let me at the outset thank cci for having uh, included me in today's meeting and the question uh, that is being given to me is um, how to uh, look into the validity of a spirometry and what are the parameters that one, one needs to look into so when you have an examination when you are given a spirometry report there are only basically two things that one need to look into number one is what is the shape of the flow volume loop we know that uh, the flow volume loop uh, basically the shape is a triangle sitting on top of a semicircle so there might be problem if the patient has not performed the spirometry well we cannot actually interpret it we have to see whether it has touched the baseline and whether the inspiration has been complete that is point number one the second thing that you need to look into is the forced expiratory time fet whether whether the person has blown out for 6 seconds or not so these are the two important things that one has to look for to look into the validity we never look into other things like um, fec is being between 150 ml because we never get time for that in a five hour which lasts for about 10 or 12 minutes only so these are the two important things that one has to look into and there are many instances when you an examiner may give you a poorly performed spirometry and ask you to read it your answer should be this has not been a well properly performed spirometry and hence it cannot be interpreted so that is the answer that the examiner would expect in such a case if it is a properly performed spirometry the first thing that one has to look into there are there are many parameters in the report but you need to focus only into three things one is the fev1 to fec ratio second is fec and third is fev1 so when we look into the fev1 to fec ratio we actually look into the absolute value not the percentage predicted we know how uh, obstruction is graded based on um, diagnose obstruction uh, based on the fev1 to fec ratio if it is less than lower limit of normal you say that obstruction is present and the next parameter that one has to look into is the fec if the fev1 to fec ratio is normal then you need to look into the fec and if it is uh, more than 80% of predicted or more than um, low limit of normal you say that that's a normal spirometry on the other hand the fec is reduced you say the restriction is present if the fev1 to fec ratio is low that is that means there is obstruction then you look into the fev1 and grade the severity of the obstruction grading the severity of obstruction actually varies we basically depend on the ats criteria to look into the uh, severity grading wherein the fev1 uh, more than uh, 70% 70 to 100% is supposed to be mild obstruction 50 to 70 is moderate 35 to 50 is severe obstruction and less than 35% you say it's very severe obstruction and in case if you find that the fev1 fec ratio is low and then the fec is also low and if it is disproportionately low compared to the fev1 drop you say it's a mixed pattern so basically these are the only parameters that you need to look into that in the minimum time that you get in a viva these are the only things that you need to look into and this is how you quickly interpret a given spirometry okay. so that is a very uh, a good light you have thrown on the pft Uh, one thing i would like to mention here that most of the times uh, students they confuse about the fe1 by fec ratio instead of taking it an absolute value they take the predicted one so here they can make a mistake so always remember that fe1 by fec ratio is an absolute value not an uh, predicted value so my next question is for uh, emma choudhary ma'am ma'am uh, uh, what are the test for assessing the small airway disease thank you mahesh thanks cci actually uh, to all the uh, listeners it's very different at the same when we are examiners and it has been very different at the other end when we are appearing so when you gave us the questions uh, it is actually much more of the study and it has enhanced my knowledge much more with the recent advances comparative to 10 years back when i gave the exam so 
small airways disease it's in general for all the listeners you all know it very well what are small airways the ones which have which are less than 2 mm in diameter you already know what are the tests it's just a matter of confidence in speaking at the time of practicals so all these uh, preparatory uh, videos that we are giving you is to help you out just to uh, recollect your knowledge and speak it at that time rather than getting confused so for small airways disease the most common that we see is on our pft the simple spirometry the fev1 by fec ratio fev3 third second by fec ratio and the most common that you all see is the fef 25 to 75 that gives us the answer on the plethysmography you can have an additional benefit you can see the ratio of the residual volume by tlc you now have the much more added ones like impedance oscillometry where you can find it if dr atri would join i would request because he has a good experience on impedance oscillometry and the feno these two are the methods where you can always have more experience and you can always assess the small airways there also but since we are not practicing he would be a better guide for all that then you can have the inert gas washout methods you can use the helium or the other gases there you have the increase in the closing volume and also you can use the phase 3 of the slope for assessing the small airways okay right? so in the exhaled nitric oxide method is the fno method other than these you can assess the small airways through the imaging the most common would be the high resolution ct then you have further add on like a hyperpolarized mri uh, then you have spect pet and scintigraphy these are all to enumerate when you are answering the question so that you can score very well that's all mahesh thank you yes uh, one of the question which was asked to me during the my dnb exam is that doctor if you are working in a village area and you do not have an uh, facility of all these things then how would you uh, assess uh, the small airways so there are indirect method that we ask patient for a post walk analysis and we see how much is their drop if uh, the drop is more than 4% then this is an indirect indicator that this patient may, may have a small airway obstruction in a case of obstructive airway disease That's a good answer. Thanks. So uh, my next question is for uh, Dr. Dipendra Rai sir. Uh, can we assess pulmonary function without any equipment? And what are the bedside pulmonary function tests? Uh, sir, you are on mute. Devasi sir. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Mahesh. And uh, first of all, good evening to you and uh, all my co-panelists. and uh, all the viewers of this webinar uh, before answering your question let me thanks uh, uh, dr atri for giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, wonderful uh, webinar and uh, i congratulate all the cci core members uh, dr nh krishna dr narayan pradeep and dr abhi doshi for creating this wonderful platform to learn the pulmonology so uh, coming to your question so this is one of the very frequently asked question especially i have seen by the senior uh, examiners ki what are the bedside pulmonary function test and how do or how do you assess the lung functions if you don't have equipment so there are several list of the test and uh, one of the test is uh, that is the breath holding time it is also called the sabrasase breath holding time so in this test we ask persons or patients to uh, just hold the breath for maximum period after the deep inhalations and it has been said that if the persons uh, hold the breath for uh, more than 24 seconds then it is said that the person having a good pulmonary function and it is said that if it is less than 15 seconds the holding time then it means that patient uh, person having a poor lung function there are study which also correlating with this uh, uh, this breath holding time and the vital capacity but i don't think there is a good correlation between that so i am not going into that the second test uh, that is uh, generally performed i have seen by uh, the anesthetic people during the psc checkup just asking the persons to just uh, do the counting in the single breath so the single breath count test so in this test we ask persons to do the maximum counting in single breath and again here uh, there is no cut up defined but one of the studies shows that uh, if the person is able to count more than 21 then you can say that person having a good uh, pulmonary function the third test is the snider match blowing test so uh, in this test we ask persons to just uh, blow out the match stick which is kept uh, at the distance of 6 cm or at the distance of 15 cm uh, in place of the match stick we can also uh, put the blowing candle if the person able to blow out the candle uh, then we can say that person having a good pulmonary function 
Uh, later on, there are some modification of this test, uh, which is called uh, modified test of Oslin. They kept the distance, they reduced the distance to uh, uh, three inches, then increased the distance into nine inch. So all these are tests to assess the uh, bedside pulmonary function test. And along with that, uh, there is also we, uh, the person or uh, student can do the chest, measure the chest expansion. Uh, so if there is a restriction in the expansion, we can say that uh, the person having restrictive pathology, if there's more expansion, then it may favor for uh, obstructive disease. There is another test called, that is a force expiratory time. So in that test, the uh, the person had to just, uh, you, you need to just keep the stethoscope at the trachea and just ask patients to forcefully exhibit for the maximum period. So if the, this period is prolonged, it again favor for obstructive disease. Uh, other tests like the person's uh, uh, after the deep inhalation, if the person able to cough out, then again, this is also one of the tests uh, which state that uh, person having a good pulmonary function. Even the bedside pulse oximeter is generally there. That is one of, also one of the uh, lung function tests, which assess both the cardiac as well as the pulmonary. So uh, these are the different tests that can be performed on the bedside. Also, bed said you can use also right pick flow meter by which you can measure the pick exploratory flow rate. So, I think these are the different tests uh, that the student need to answer if uh, this type of question asked uh, uh, during the VABA exam. Thank you. Okay, sir. So, uh, you have very well enumerated about the bedside tests. So, now I'll ask the next question to uh, Dr. Debasis Bera, sir. Uh, sir, mentioned the different screening questionnaires for obstructive sleep apnea. So you are on mute, Devasish, sir. Thank you, sir, for this uh, nice question. And uh, good evening, my co-panelists and all the viewers. Uh, so first, I would like to thank uh, the CCI for providing me this opportunity. Uh, so uh, the question is that uh, how to assess uh, a patient of uh, obstructive sleep apnea by sleep questionnaire. So whenever a patient uh, of obstructive sleep apnea having uh, clinical signs and symptoms of uh, maybe excessive daytime sleepiness, snoring, irritability, witness apnea comes to us. So before uh, going for uh, this uh, polysomnography, we have to assess the patients uh, by asking some questions, uh, which are basically known as the sleep questionnaires. A lot of questionnaires are there in literature, like uh, this effort sleepiness score, Berlin questionnaire, uh, uh, stop bank questionnaire, then uh, Stanford uh, sleep questionnaire, East Box sleep quality index. But among uh, all the questionnaire, uh, in practical scenario, you usually uh, prefer two questionnaire mainly. One is effort sleepiness score, and the second one is uh, stop bank questionnaire. Uh, basically, what effort sleepiness score is? In effort sleepiness score, we have to ask the patient who is suffering from maybe USA. Uh, what is your uh, chance of uh, feeling uh, this drowsiness or sleepiness while doing some activities? Like uh, he's traveling in a car, he's talking to someone else, he's uh, sitting alone, watching TV, and uh, grading that severity from 0 to 3. If he, if he is normal, then it is 0. If he is having severe uh, sleepiness, then it is 3. And 1, 2 is mild to moderate. And there are 8 uh, things we have to ask. And for each point, we have to score from 0 to 3. So overall score is 0 to 24. So when the patient is having a post sleepiness score of more than 10, then we can stamp that the patient is having excessive daytime sleepiness. Then one another question we generally uh, take in, uh, into consideration is top bank questionnaire, yeah? basically STOP and BANG, S for uh, snoring, uh, T for tiredness, O for uh, uh, observed apnea, then uh, P for pressure, that is if the patient is having uh, elevated blood pressure. Then uh, B for BMI, A for age, N for neck sun conference, and G for gender. If it is 0 to 2, then the patient is having low risk of uh, OSA. If it is 3 to 4, then uh, moderate. If it is more than uh, 5, it is severe. But the bottom line being is that uh, in all the questionnaire, uh, the sensitivity of this questionnaire is quite high, maybe around 80 to 90, but the specificity is quite low. So we cannot, uh, based upon this questionnaire finding, we cannot stamp the patient that the patient is having obstructive sleep apnea. Ultimately, we have to go for the gold standard that is level 1 polysomnography or level 2, 3, whatever the options available there. We have seen in our, uh, must, uh, everybody must have seen that uh, a lot of patients uh, were already put on auto sleep up uh, based upon these uh, clinical findings of excessive daytime sleepiness, but ideally it should not be. 
because excessive daytime sleepiness uh, a patient complaining of it is not indicative of absolute obstructive sleep apnea it might be due to something else right it may be due to uh, poor sleep hygiene may be due to a case known as narcolepsy it may be medication induced something else so you have to go for this polish sonography to conclude your diagnosis so this sleep questionnaire are only for screening then to conclude you have to go for level 1 polish sonography okay very well directed sir uh, the bottom line is even if the you are if you are clinically there is strong suspicion of osa and even though your questionnaire show there is a low probability of yeah. obstructive sleep apnea still we have to go ahead with the level polish sonography polish sonography so my next question is for uh, arjun sir sir how do you diagnose copd based on spirometry So, oh, Mahesh, uh, basically, this is uh, a very important point. Uh, we know that the diagnosis of COPD is basically made up made by three factors. Number one is the classical symptoms. Second is the risk factor exposure, and number three, it has to be confirmed by spirometry. When you suspect COPD and when you do a spirometry, you always look at the post bronchodilator values. You give do the baseline spirometry first, give a short acting bronchodilator, repeat the maneuver, and then look into the post bronchodilator values. If the post bronchodilator FEV1 by FEC ratio is less than 0.7, then you think in terms of COPD. But when you go by the latest gold guidelines, very clearly says that if the FEV1 by FEC ratio is between 0.6 to 0.8, single spirometry you cannot make a diagnosis of COPD, and you have to repeat the maneuver at some other point in time, and then make sure that the value is less than 0.7. so that is how we make a diagnosis it's basically the post bronchodilator value that you look into the reason is that uh, the, because of the conventional fact that in copd there is not good a uh, lot of diversity that is why you look into the post bronchodilator value now that is number one the second point is um, once you make a diagnosis of copd then there is a grading of the severity of copd based on the spirometry itself this is what we call as gold 1 to gold 4 classes if the fev1 is more than 80% you say and if in the ratio is less you say it is mild copd if the fev1 percentage is uh, between 50 to 80 you say it's moderate copd if it is between 30 to 50 you say it's severe copd and if it is less than 30% you say it's very severe copd what we need to understand is there is a slight difference in the way in which gold grades the severity as compared to the ats way of grading severity which i alluded to in my earlier question okay sir so as you can i add to one can i add one point to dr mahesh yes, yes. so uh, one of the questions uh, generally i have asked by uh, myself i have asked to uh, which respiratory indices used to assess the large airway function it is very frequently asked that uh, how we assess the small airway function but which respiratory indices are used to large airway function so there are many students unable to answer so it is a peak expiratory flow rate which is mainly used to assess the large airway function FEF 25 75 for a small airway and FEV1 that is that is for both large and small airway. So I think the student need to remember this is the three indices for large airway and the uh, one indices for both large and small and the, the one indices like FEF FEF 25 75 for a small airway. So that that's one point to just add and another point which is very important. Frequently asked that LLN, what is uh, LLN lower level of normal? They never ask about the cutoff and how to define the LLN. So this is also very frequently asked. So that things also need to be uh, clear to among this team. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, this is a very important point which you have mentioned. Everybody asks about the small airway, but but large airway they may uh, get confused. So my next question is for uh, Dr. Chaudhary, ma'am. Ma'am, um, uh, what are the indications uh, to do DLCO and severity grading of DLCO? Okay, so uh, basically, um, in general, I would say, uh, ask the students whichever books you follow for reading the uh, PFT, you know what is diffusion. It is the volume of the carbon monoxide taken up by the lung divided by the alveolar minus capillary pressure of the CO difference. So basically, we know that there are four methods how we do it: the single breath, the steady state. the rebreathing and the equilibrium the most common that we do is the single breath it is said to be more stable and that is why it is preferred now what we actually do in there you know you should go even if at your center dlc is not being done you should do it's a mixture of gas uh, there is a set proportion where there is 0.28% of carbon monoxide 
14 percent of helium, 18 percent of oxygen, and the rest is on nitrogen. And we ask the patient to take a deep breath and hold for 10 seconds. What he exhales, that is measured. Okay, and on this basis, we check what is the diffusion. Now, indications, it's a common sense. Wherever you feel that the R, uh, it gas exchange barrier it is getting disturbed, wherever, whichever disease the gas exchange barrier is getting disturbed would affect your diffusion. So any of the disease like emphysema or uh, uh, alveoli are having breakups and the uh, alveoli are becoming larger. So they are decreasing in their function. So one of the indications would be emphysema. All the interstitial lung diseases or wherever you feel that the parenchyma is affected so that the diffusion can get affected, all these diseases would come as the indications. One of the rare questions that can be asked to use, you should know what are the diseases where the DNCU can get increased. Now, this is where our main diffusion is based on what? We are seeing the carbon monoxide being uh, diffused from one area to another. But there is a binding with the hemoglobin. So wherever the hemoglobin in the alveoli is increasing, any of the alveolar hemorrhage conditions, so Wegener's, uh, good pasture syndrome, any of these would lead to increase in DLC. This is one of the rare questions that can be asked or even can be in your MCQs or in, even in the left to right shunt where the uh, primary uh, pressures increase. So all these conditions would have a, uh, wherever the blood flow of the pulmonary stature is increasing, would have an increase in DLC. Wherever our gas exchange is getting affected, would have a decrease in DLC. Simple concept rather than just having a rectify of the conditions. Thanks very much. Uh, severity, sorry, I uh, have to mention about the severity. So mild would be more than between 60% to again, as I mentioned, you should know what is the lower limit of normal. Between 60% to low, uh, lower limit of normal is the mild, moderate would become 40 to 60 and severe would become less than 40. This would be the severity gradient. So I think I have come, uh, uh, covered the whole of the DLC on this. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I end on point, Mahesh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, apart from all the indications that ma'am said, there is one more indication where DLC is commonly used. That is for pre-operative assessment before lung resection. So you can actually predict the risk of post-operative complications based on the DLC. If it is less than 40%, there is a high chance of post-operative complications. So that is it, another indication. To, uh, thanks, thanks for adding. I did miss it. Yes. Uh, and again, uh, some of the patients usually refer to government hospital for uh, uh, fitness for work, to join the work. So if patient does not qualify clinically, even if and he does not qualify from the spirometry criteria, then the next thing which we have to go ahead is the CPET. So this is the question can be asked to students. So my next question is to uh, Dr. Devas is right. Uh, how to define common lung volumes and capacities? Can I answer uh, this question? Yes, sir. Debasi, sir. Like, can I answer, Dr. Mahesh, myself? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Depender. Depend right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, this is again a very important question and very frequently asked. And uh, I have seen the many students not able to define. Although uh, we have read in from the first year in physiology uh, chapters uh, how to define the various lung volume, but students not able to define. So uh, there are basically four volume and four capacity they need to remember. And this uh, four volume, the one is the tidal volume. So what is tidal volume? So it is the volume of air that we breathe in and breathe out during the normal respiration. So that is basically a tidal volume. What is the residual volume? So it is the maximum volume of air that we can retain in the lung even after the maximal expiration. So that is the residual volume. What is ERB? So it is the maximum volume of air that we can exhale even after the normal expiration. So that need to remember this. After normal expiration, the volume of air that we can still exhale after the maximum exhalation. And similarly, the IRB, that IRB inspiratory reserve volume. So it is the maximum volume of air that we can inhale after the normal inspiration. So that is IRB. So these are the four volume. And uh, uh, coming to capacity, so there are four capacity they need to remember. If you combine all the all the four volume, it means this is the total lung capacity. If you're combining the three volume except the residual volume, it is the vital capacity. If you're combining this expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume, that is a force residual capacity. 
and if you're combining this uh, irb with uh, tidal volume that is inspiratory capacity so they must know i think this four volume and four capacity there is no excuse for that they need to define this uh, uh, this eight terminology i think uh, during the exam or during the baba oh. thank you yes and uh, there can be a different uh, questions permutation combination all these lung volumes and capacities where the lung volume increases where the lung volume can decrease where the frc can increase where the residual volume uh, residual volume can increase so uh, everybody should be prepared for such kind of questions so my next uh, question uh, is to dr devasis uh, i'll just change now from it is one spirometry uh, to uh, abg so uh, conditions that uh, which are the conditions that invalidate a uh, abg result dr devasis thank you sir uh, sir actually it's a very practical question i must say because we often draw the abg and uh, give it to our uh, patient attendant or maybe the ward boy Uh, being completely unaware that uh, when uh, it is being done and in which condition it is being done so there are some factors that actually invalidate or alter the abg result the first and foremost thing is the time period between the drawing of the arterial blood and the test being done so ideally if we are not uh, if we are giving the sample as uh, like that without uh, eyes preservative then ideally it should be done immediately if you are uh, giving it in a ice pack sample then you can delay up to 30 minutes to 1 hour so what happen if you will uh, not do it immediately actually this uh, oxygen po2 value becomes low because oxygen diffuses out of this uh, plastic syringe and due to metabolism this carbon dioxide concentration might increase so delay in time po2 will decrease pco2 will increase so ultimately the ph will fall and the second thing is that we often used this anticoagulant heparin sir in uh, to mix uh, with that of the blood to prevent uh, coagulation so if you we'll use uh, heparin is a, a big amount so that might uh, have a dilutional effect and heparin itself has some acidic properties so it might alter the ph result and sometimes if we are using this uh, uh, electrolytically imbalanced heparin it also affects the potassium and calcium value also then uh, a common mistake we usually do is the air bubble before sending the sample for lab investigation we should ensure that our syringe is uh, free of uh, all the air bubbles so if some air bubble will inside uh, the syringe along with your arterial blood that might also affect your po2 and pco2 so what will, what happens if uh, some air bubble will remain inside the arterial blood so obviously the po2 will increase if your patient is hypoxemic we know that the uh ambient air has a po2 value of around 150 uh, 60 so if the patient is hypoxemic so obviously there will be a false elevation in po2 and uh, pco2 not much difference but it will slightly decrease but there will be a false elevation in po2 then uh, fourth thing we often see that uh, your our nurses uh, become uh, uh, taking a lot of prick to the patient while drawing the arterial blood so patient become very anxiety become uh, very nervous or anxiety and uh, started becoming hyperventilating so in that condition the co2 level might fall leading to a false sense of respiratory alkalosis so these are the three to four factors like the time between the drawing of blood to the test second being a heparinized uh, sample third is uh, our uh, uh, large air bubble and fourth one is uh, this uh, uh, over anxiety or uh, hyperventilation that should be taken into consideration and when the the last thing i must say when the patient is on the ventilator and we are drawing the arterial blood sample for investigation then the ventilator settings must be uh, ensured and uh, minimum fio2 fio2 you have to tell there is no point of reading the abg unless and until you are no not knowing that uh, with how much fio2 my patient and uh, the second thing is peep these two things should be written on the abg report in which peep and what fio2 my patient abg has been to if anyone has to add something please they can add uh, sir uh, invalidity of abg so at the beginning of the this webinar i mentioned whenever you are given the abg it is always preferable to ask what is the clinical scenario yeah 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 definitely so so sometimes there is a patient who is having um, um, interstitial lung disease patient has come in respiratory distress and his po2 is found to be uh, 120 on room air 
So this yeah. can indirectly give it is that this can be an air bubble. Sometimes yes, sir, yes, sir. pH is around 7.35, 7.36. PCO2 yeah. is 40, and PO2 is normal. Uh, then and we said there is an acidosis uh, is seen. However, the patient is not having a clinical scenario like that. Then we have to indirectly say that there can be a over hyperinization of the ABG syringe. Very so good. these are the indirect evidences which we have to keep. So the bottom line is uh, always and always ask for the clinical scenario. Clinical scenario, definitely. I agree, sir. Sir, no. So uh, mm -hmm. my next question. One is point for, I would uh, like to add. Yes, sir. Very important to. It is always important to take a smaller syringe. What I have seen the people take a five ml syringe like this, yes, that also affect. You take a small syringe, it should occupy at least fifty percent of the syringe. So uh, that is the ideal uh, uh, way to take the ABG. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. So my next question is for uh, Arjun sir. Uh, what are the various types of NIV masks, and how do you choose the right NIV mask? thank you uh, this is a kind of the question which is usually asked uh, in the instruments uh, part of the viva uh, you may be given a when nav when you may be given a mask and asked to identify what sort of mask is it so basically there are two things one needs to understand here basically we can look at the look into the mask in two ways number one you see, you have a mask which covers the nose and the mouth which is called an oral nasal mask and then you have a mask which covers the nose alone which is called a nasal mask for acute conditions in emergency we always use a full face mask and a oro nasal mask that is point number 1 the second point is the nasal mask is virtually reserved for chronic home ventilation so when we talk about the full face mask there are actually two types of full face mask and this is something which you are asked to identify you will be given a mask and asked to identify what type of full face mask it is it could be a vented mask or it could be a non vented mask the basic difference is some um, where you use it in a vented mask there is an outlet for the exhaled air so you use a vented mask when you use a single tubing circuit to the niv if you are using a, a double uh, a tubing circuit then you always use a non vented mask so the basic way in which quickly you can identify these two is by looking into the color of the elbow of the mask if the elbow is white it is a vented mask if the elbow is blue it is a non vented mask that is how you usually identify this so this becomes important so this is something which you see usually ask when you are given this mask so that is the point which i wanted to convey how to differentiate between these two masks okay uh, so the color coding which you mentioned was uh, really nice i wasn't aware of it i agree agree even i was not aware of it thank you sir so my next question is for uh, imma choudhary ma'am Um, that is very important i think uh, uh, because it should not be a wrong combination otherwise what happened there is we increase co2 rebreathing so the patient may go to the hypercapnia so in the single tube you can't give this uh, non vented mask in ic ventilator double lumen uh, double lumen tube inspiratory experiment you can go with the non vented mask but in the single tube bipap uh, it is always good to use this uh, uh, vented mask to reduce the co2 rebreathing and that is also called the, the leakage occur through a gallison port is called a intentional leakage sometimes say that i would stop all the leakage it is not like that the leakage occur through this this vented portion it is a intentional leakage and the non intentional leakage is leakage which occur around the marks so basically we don't want this non intentional leakage but intentional leakage is okay we can do for that that is helpful thank you so my next question I is for i'm still uh, connected uh, though the video won't come because the light has gone So never mind. Go ahead with the question. Okay. So, uh, Imam, ma'am, the question is for you. Um, how do you initiate NIV for a patient who is in uh, emergency room uh, who presents with COPD exacerbation and type two respiratory failure? Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, since my thesis was on NIV, so I would like to mention a few basic things that everyone should know. And this is uh, apart from what you answer in the question. This is on your practice basis. one is you should always know the indications and contraindications so uh, you should always be sure that there is no pneumo because niv should not be put in a undrained pneumothorax case second is you are not delaying the use of a mechanical ventilation if the patient is deteriorating in just having this in your mind that we have to use the niv so this delay would actually harm the patient now in general whenever we have the bipap or the cpap uh you should know that the cpap the basic two indications are the cardiogenic pulmonary edema and the obstructive sleep apnea so in every other condition we prefer to get bipap bipap as you both as you all know is a bi level so we have a inspiratory and the expiratory pressures now whenever we are putting the pressures uh what we saw in our pg time was 
the seniors just used to tell the pressures how they decide we would not know so we learned of the time even if they say higher pressures you have to be sure that high pressures cause claustrophobia to the patient and your patient would become more phobic in addition to their dyspnea and their additional effort and the respiratory rate so this would create a havoc so always start from the lowest epap and the ipap now in certain machines it would be 4 4 certain machines i ipap would be lower 6 and epap would be lower 4 so you can put those settings on the ipap never directly put the mask on the face of the patient always make the patient feel on the hand that this is the pressure we would be feeling you would feel like this on your face let the patient agree to it then hold the mask at a distance and let the patient feel the pressure okay once the patient has adapted even to this then ask the patient to hold the mask in front of his face and you just adjust the strapping from the hand this is the ideal way of doing your patient would exactly comply to do this here. but if you ask the sister to put it and they directly put it without even explaining to the patient the patient would run off try to throw the mask and the situation would become worse now if the patient has started adapting observe over the time and slowly you increase the epap and the ipap so once the patient has adapted increase the ipap by 2 observe whether the patient is able to tolerate then go to the epap settings increase by 2 again watch so you have to see what are the best settings in which the patient is compliant to it, both in ipap and epap too much high epap would also make the patient uncomfortable so you have to see to it which is the best way the patient is having respiratory wise saturation wise all your use of accessory muscles all this has to be evaluated when you are going through these settings and the best settings you yourself can judge and then fit on to those settings the second thing you should take care of is all these patients who are on chronic use of the backup machines their nose bridge gets eroded it becomes more and more painful with every time you put the niv people wouldn't understand you just keep teaching them drowsy and you give them more pain so i would suggest rather than versus do is you tell them put a bandaid what they keep on doing is put a gauze or the jaisi mask teda hoga they keep adjusting with it all the more eroded the skin becomes very painful and these are the ones who need it chronic use of mask more than uh, 12 hours at times more than 6 hours in the night more than 2 hours in the day so prefer using a bandaid where your mask is coming the mask should be a proper fit the mask as sir explained you should see ventilated and non ventilated maybe we never uh, learned this because we have always seen with two tubings and we never knew what is a one tubing kind of thing but you should be aware you are having a good opportunity to learn from a lot of people thank you Uh, i'll request other panelists if they have any say or any would uh, they would like to contribute so i have uh, one question very frequently ask uh, uh, especially uh, in the relative with the niv okay, what are the troubleshoot in the niv i don't know this questions this is very frequently asked question what are the different troubleshoot while using the niv and uh, most common troubleshooting is that is the issue of the leakage then patient ventilator asynchrony which could be as a missed trigger or double trigger so all these questions that can be asked and uh, this question uh, answers will be also prepared uh, uh, the students thank you as uh, uh, madam has mentioned that you should, you should start from the lower pressures see how the patient tolerates and then step wise you increase so the uh, one of the question is frequently asked how much to increase how much to go up to the answer is that you should target a pressure which will achieve your target ventilation in patient so that pressure you have to achieve and uh, you, uh, you have to uh, monitor the patient clinically and if required you have to uh, repeat the arterial blood gas analysis to assess how much is their improvement okay so uh, my next uh, question is for uh, dipendra rai sir so uh, what are the types of nebulizers and uh, uh, which is the ideal one and which type is used to give nebulized antibiotics okay so uh, just to beak back uh, types of nebulizers so just to beak back uh, uh, there was a wonderful webinar on this nebulized antibiotic by cci yeah. so uh, there are basically three types of nebulizer the oldest one is the jet nebulizer then ultrasonic nebulizer and the third one the recent one that is a vibrating mass technology so uh, the jet nebulizer uh, we all know that it is the best on the principles of jet here uh, in which uh, we pass the pressurized gas through the small orifice 
and uh, uh, it is very noisy you know this, this is one of the drawback of this uh, jet nebulizer vibrating mess is a recent one and uh, there are several advantage of that other than the cost factor so uh, uh, it is a, the residual volume is very less and uh, if you give the treatment duration is also very short so if if you, if you can give the drugs in very short period of times and there will be also lesser residual volume it is less than 0.2 so uh, we can uh, I, i don't know i think it would be better to give this antibiotic through vibrating mess because uh, there will be less wastage of the drugs this is the costly drugs and there would be also uh, the viability would be better with this vibrating mess if you are giving the antibiotic uh, i just ask the other co-panelists uh, if uh, any others view on that no you are right sir and the only other point is that when you use a vibrating mesh nebulizer the nebulization time is also shortened because yeah. it's more effective so you can finish off the solution in a quicker period of time as compared to the jet nebulizer and one of the problem with ultrasonic nebulizer is that with the time there is a it is said that the solution temperature increase and that can denature the drug formulations so that may be a lead to less effectiveness of that so uh, i think vibrating mesh technology would be the better option for uh, giving this nebulizer antibiotic uh one very common question is asked if suppose there is a no uh, nebulization machine is not available and you have to give a, a nep to a type 2 respiratory patient now how will you give the sometimes the patient sometimes the people use through a oxygen port oxygen so and this is very dangerous i think yeah. can, patient can actually land into a type 2 respiratory failure so so that that should be avoided as much as possible yeah. I think the nursing staff do this. I think even they have a nebulizer. I have seen they start giving this through that in COPD patients. So that is very dangerous. I need to inform them. Yeah. Yeah. So these all these nurses in the uh, respiratory units have to be taught that any patient who has had a level of COPD, even if there is a confusion, or you see ABG in the CO two is increased, do not give nebulization with uh, O two. use yes. uh, titrate the o2 according to the requirement of the physician and you can put nebulizer mask on the top of it and give with the nebulizer so they have to be or you have to write in bold and all the notes yes, yes. so that they can blend with it i told you you cannot give to any patient agree <laughs> in my respiratory unit <laughs> one more point mahesh um, something which is known but all the pgs need to know is that uh, when you have a patient with acute asthma and you don't have a nebulizer or the nebulizer is not working what is the alternative it's used to it is to use a spacer device and give um, four or six puffs of short acting beta to agnes which is as effective as a nebulizer yes sir okay. one more question often asked in our practical examination ki how much puff uh, in a pm di is equivalent to one nebulization that is probably 6 to 8 puff probably Six to eight puff in PM di is equivalent to one respiratory of the nebulization. This yes. most often asked in practical examination, sir. The effect of uh, MDI with spacer versus the nebulization is same. Only that with the nebulizer, the drug deposition is more. Probably side effect can be more. So my next question is for uh, Devasi, sir. Uh, sir, uh, enumerate the various levels of uh, sleep study. and indications for various levels yeah. uh, so basically uh, uh, theoretically there are four levels of sleep studies one is level 1 2 3 4 but practically whatever is available people are going for that one maybe level 1 2 3 4 but there exists some basic difference between all these four so level 1 what does it mean by level 1 it is an in lab and attended polysomnography sir so in lab what do i mean by in lab the patient has to go to the sleep lab it may be in a hospital or somewhere else and uh, uh, attended the uh, mean uh, one doctor or may uh, or maybe a technician has to be there throughout the night so that is in lab and attended polysomnography that is the level 1 and in level 1 we generally takes the seven parameters 4 e if one is eeg for our brain activity eog e for ocular activity then emg for muscle activity and ecg for heart activity then for effort we have to use thoracic or abdominal belt and for air flow we have to use uh, nasal cannula or nasal thermistor and for saturation you have to see for pulse oximetry so level 1 is the best uh, level of polysomnography because all the parameters are there the advantage being is that sir we can uh, identify the sleep states whether it is a rem sleep or non rem sleep 
if at all it is a non rem sleep whether it is n1 n2 or n3 and at the same time if titration is required then the manual titration can be done in the level 1 position as the technician or doctor is there along with the patient then level 2 is sir it is uh, we have to use the seven parameters but it is a uh, non attended uh, on attended polysomnography uh, just uh, you have to put the lead to the patient and uh, has to see the report in the morning then level 3 sir we have to use uh, four parameters basically one is uh, for effort one is for flow one is for saturation and one is for heart rate and uh, level 4 uh, is uh, we have to see only one to two parameters maybe saturation and heart rate so most of the centers what we have seen uh, you, you we all must have been seen that people are going for this level 3 polysomnography which is a home sleep testing we can say in practical words because uh, people are coming with this sleep report in which uh, sleep stages are not there only the events like apnea or hypopnea are like that so this is a level 3 polysomnography so practically we can divide sir this apart from this level 1 2 3 4 there are two kinds of sleep studies we must say one is in lab one is home sleep apnea testing so when we can go for home sleep apnea testing home sleep apnea testing is uh, basically level 2 or 3 so when the pre test probability of your sleep apnea is moderate to high you can suspect that yes my patient from the questionnaire maybe or clinical signs and symptoms you can assume that my patient is having severe chance of moderate to severe apnea just to conclude i am doing my sleep study so in that case we can go for this home sleep apnea test and uh, when the patient doesn't have any comorbidities like uh, hypertension heart failure uh, severe diabetes mellitus or any concomitant other sleep disorders like parasomnia periodic leg movement disorders insomnia so if these parameters are associated with the patient then ultimately you have to go for level 1 level 1 is the best if you are suspecting that my patient might have been suffering from obstructive sleep apnea you are not sure and you have to uh, and your patient is having lot of comorbidities then level 1 is the best sleep study you have to uh, go for detailed evaluation of the sleep stages what are the events you can manually titrate also at the same study and in the titration also you can go Uh, see whether my patient has achieved rem sleep or not like that so level 1 is the best sleep study but most of the people are coming with the reports of this level 2 and sir very well mentioned sir the i the investigation of choice for uh, obstructive sleep apnea is level 1 sleep study yes sir but in a uh, resource limited setting you do not have an access to a level 1 study then you can take the help of sleep questionnaires if there is a moderate to high probability of obstructive sleep apnea then yeah. you can you may consider doing level 2 level 3 but it is always advisable that you should go ahead with the level 1 sleep study level 1 sir so uh, next question is for uh, uh, p arjun sir uh, sir um, uh, sir can you uh, enumerate some nebulized antibiotics their indications and precautions for use thank you this is actually taking forward from what dr deependra kumar has said so when we talk about nebulized antibiotics in respiratory medicine the first and foremost condition that comes to our mind is bronchiectasis non cf bronchiectasis is the commonest condition where we use uh, nebulized antibiotics and in bronchiectasis itself there are actually three different situations where you tend to use nebulized bronchi um, antibiotics number one is a patient who has three or more exacerbations per year that could um, be an indication to use nebulized antibiotics number 2 a patient who has few exacerbations but pseudomonas is being isolated and number 3 patients uh, who have non pseudomonas isolate but they cannot tolerate an oral drug uh, which is used for eradication like azithromycin or something if it is not effective if it cannot be tolerated again is an indication to give nebulized antibiotics in bronchi cases so in bronchi cases itself there are three different indications and of course we know that like for cystic fibrosis it is well indicated and it's used very um, very effectively the other two important conditions where nebulized antibiotics are used in respiratory diseases are would be for, um, for um, ventilator associated pneumonias where you use colistin and then uh, for ntm uh, pulmonary disease especially for mac infection you use nebulized amikacin nebulized amikacin is used the commonly used drugs number one is the most commonly used is dobramycin number two is colistin number three is um, the other drugs which are rarely used one is amikacin and other is astriana so the basic question is uh, which is the most commonly used drug if it is asked in the examination for bronchitis 
your answer should be uh, according to the ERS guidelines, it is tropramycin, and according to the BTS guidelines, it is colst. So usually give it for twenty. Um, there are phase of giving it also. So for eradication, you usually give for three months at a go. Tropramycin three hundred milligram twice daily as nebulized form. Or there is another form of rotating antibiotics where you give for twenty eight days, and for the next twenty eight days, you, uh, do not give the drug. You again keep on recycling and rotating the drug. So these are the various ways of doing it. The other thing which um, uh, we need to understand is what are the common side effects, especially with dobramycin, which is a commonly used drug. The most common side effect for dobramycin is bronchospasm. The drug itself can induce bronchospasm. The other things like nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity are very, very, very rare with dobramycin. So another important thing is how do you understand? How do you determine whether the given patient is a candidate for nebulized antibiotics? For that, actually, they, you need to do a certain you know, which is very clearly given in the BTS guidelines. So the first thing that one should do is uh, when you are contemplating to start nebulized antibiotics, the first thing that one needs to do is to do a spirometry. You do a spirometry maneuver first, give the nebulized antibiotic, and repeat the spirometry. You look for two things: whether the patient develops any symptoms of thrombosis, or whether there is a drop in the lung function. If these two are not there, then the patient can be safely given nebulized antibiotics at home. On the other hand, if the patient develops bronchospasm or there is a drop in in the lung value function levels, especially the FeV1 value um, more than twelve percent, two hundred mL, what you need to do is you give a short-acting bronchodilator and then ensure that the bronchi that the spirometer comes back to normal. The patient now has to be called back on it another day. In this day, first you pre-medicate the patient with a short-acting bronchodilator nebulization, followed by the inhaled antibiotic, and then repeat the spirometry and see whether the symptoms are there. If the symptoms and the drop in lung function are not there, then the patient can be given nebulized antibiotics, but with a caveat that the patient has to be pre-medicated with a short-acting bronchodilator every time you give the antibiotic. If again after giving bronchodilator and the patient has symptoms of drop in lung function, then you have to that um, you exclude that um, particular patient from being given a nebulized antibiotic. So that is very clearly you can exclude that person that he is not a candidate for nebulized antibiotics. So this is in short about the uh, the indications, the drugs, the contraindication, complication, how to identify the right candidate. Thank you, sir. This is a very uh, comprehensive analysis of nebulized antibiotic. Uh, my next uh, question is for uh, Imma Chaudhary, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, which anti-tuberculosis drugs are contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation, and what ATT is to be given for drug-sensitive TB in pregnancy and lactation? Okay, so everyone should know that in as per our guidelines and everywhere in the books, the first line ATT is safe in pregnancy and lactation. Okay, so first line means the four drugs. I'm not including the streptomycin. It is of the first line list now, and we should also know streptomycin is autotoxic, should not be given. Also, the second line injectables are contraindicated because they have the effect of teratogenicity. But for all the drug sensitive TB, it is safe in pregnancy as well as lactation. It is in addition, it is said that it would give advantage to the child from protecting from TB. Right? Also, in addition, they are saying that the child should receive. Isoniazid as a prophylaxis also once the child is delivered. So all these have to be followed. The newer drugs, Bedaquil and Delimited, they are contraindicated. And since we are talking about the drug sensitive TB, all four drugs can be easily given in the dosages recommended as per the weight. Thank you. Any additions from anyone? No, I will take. Before uh, before removing the streptomycin from the first line drug, there was a question: If a lactating mother can she be given a streptomycin injection? So the answer is she can be given streptomycin injection as streptomycin is not secreted in milk. So most of the times people tend to say that it is a contraindicated. So this is the catch for students. So my next question is for uh, Dipendra Rai sir. Uh, so mention agents for the pleurodesis. Complications during the pleurodesis. Deependra Rai sir. 
Thank you. So this is also a very important question. Uh, generally, the periodicities agent kept on the table and asked about the related the question related with the periodicities. So uh, periodicities is basically a procedure in which we uh, obliterate the pleural space to prevent the uh, recurrent pleural effusion or recurrent pneumothorax. And the most common uh, indication is the patient with a malignant pleural effusion. So uh, uh, how we generally do so in that uh, procedure, we inject some fibrogenic or scrudging agent into the pleural space, which produces intense inflammation in the pleura, and that lead to uh, a symphysis of this uh, visceral parietal pleura or approximation of this visceral uh, parietal pleura. So this is the most common indication in the malignant pleural effusion. And uh, there are several agents that have been used and you know the agent uh, use vary across center to center depending upon the availability of the drugs. None of the agent is ideal. The ideal agent is said that those who are uh, easily available, it should not cost too much. It should be free from side effect. But uh, the different center, they have used uh, different uh, agents. Uh, in my center, I'm personally using the betadine uh, more frequently uh, rather than the tall. So the agent, there are different agents like most commonly the tall use which is used in two forms, generally talk slurry and the talk portrage. The talk portrage is generally used during the medical thoracoscopy through the atomizer we are doing. And the talk slurry is generally putting through the chest tube. The other agent uh, uh, like uh, silver nitrate, many antibiotic, toxicycline, minocycline, even erythromycin that have been uh, evaluated for the pleurodesis. And uh, like uh, silver nitrate, bleomycin that has been uh, evaluated in many trials. Uh, silver nitrate, many antineoplastic drugs that have been also evaluated, corin bacterium parvum, that have been also evaluated. Uh, uh, so there is a long list of this. There is no need to remember this long list, the commonly used uh, agent that you need to remember. So these are the different agents uh, that are used for the pleurodesis. Okay, sir. So my next question uh, is for uh, Debasis Vera, sir. Uh, what are the parameters uh, we need to see on a sleep report as a pulmonologist in sequence to diagnose a case of sleep disordered breathing? Can I add some one point before that question? Can I add one point yes. that is very important, yes. especially uh, like the side effect of this uh, pleurodesis? One of the very frequently concerned that, especially with the tall patient, may develop acute respiratory failure or ARDS like situation. And it happened. Uh, there are case reports, and especially it is said that uh, when the particle size is small and if the dose of tall is more than five gram, then there is an increased risk of acute respiratory failure. So, this is an important uh, side effect, I think, that need to remember uh, because the examiner can ask them uh, which one is the fatal side effect that can occur during the pleurodosis. Otherwise, the other side effect simple due to the inflammation that can occur, fever, chest pain, or because inflammation also associated with the coagulation cascade activation. So it also risk of pulmonary thromboembolism or of course the risk of infection is there. So maybe converted to effusion into the impyma. So these are the different side effects. But the important one is to remember that there could be a risk of ARDS with the use of TOLC. So that question very frequently asked by the examiner. Thank you. We have both uh, French grade and American grade talc, so that is how you differentiate that. The US uh, talc is smaller size and it is more notorious to produce ARDS. The French grade talc is larger size and it's much more safer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, next question, as I mentioned to Devasis Deva Vera, sir. Uh, what are the parameters we need to see on a sleep study report as a uh, pulmonologist to diagnose a case of sleep disorder breathing? Uh, this is a very practical question, sir. And maybe in the uh, practical examination, everybody is asked to read a sleep report. So being a pulmonologist, we often came across uh, cases of uh, sleep-related breathing disorders, less often this insomnia and accolades like that. So the first and foremost thing we should see while uh, studying a sleep report, you have to first see it, whether it is a diagnostic study or a speed track study. So diagnostic study, basically, it is used to diagnose only a case of obstructive sleep apnea. And what is late night study? In the first half of the night, you can go for your uh, diagnostic study. And in the next part, if your patient is having obstructive sleep apnea, then you can you have to go for this titration, maybe manual or maybe auto uh, CPAP level of titration. So first, you have to see whether it is a diagnostic or split night. If at all it is a di uh, diagnostic study, then you have to uh, see this RDI or AHI. What is RDI? It is a respiratory disturbance index per hour. 
so if your rdi is less than 5 then it is normal so and if it is 5 to 15 it is uh, known as mild variety of os 15 to 30 moderate more than 30 is severe so that is the diagnostic person from the diagnostic person you can know whether my patient is uh, suffering from this uh, obstructive sleep apnea or not and then uh, some other parameters you should look for that is the minimum saturation the patient uh, has uh, uh, shown in the psd report uh, throughout the night why it is important because uh, we often came across some patients uh, during the uh, diagnostic portion they uh, desaturated up to 60 maybe 65 the more severe is the desaturation more is the dangerous uh, for that patient because uh, those with compromised heart function such a level of hypoxia might precipitate arrhythmia that you have to keep in mind uh, so minimum saturation the patient uh, uh, has achieved during the uh, diagnostic or therapeutic portion that has to be noted and the minimum heart rate also like the level of bradycardia if your patient is going up to 40 45 that is also an alarming sign for that patient so these are the things that uh, you should uh, look for and another thing uh, you should look for is sleep efficiency so what i mean by sleep efficiency it is the amount of time that the patient has slept out of total time in the bed suppose your patient has slept uh, for 3 hours out of 6 hours in bed Uh, so this is basically the sleep efficiency is around 50% so that might be due to frequent awakening due to obstructive sleep apnea or maybe some other disorders like uh, insomnia then uh, while tracing the uh, therapeutic portion that is the uh, after going for a diagnostic study if your uh, therapeutic portion titration study has been done so you have to see for the pressure requirement for that patient so how you have to see for the pressure requirement you have to select the optimal pressure uh, in at which all the events got eliminated for that patient basically the aim of therapeutic portion is to eliminate all the events starting from apnea hypopnea desaturation or snoring so you have to see at which pressure all the events got eliminated if you are uh, at 10, 11 uh, cm of water all your events got eliminated then the pressure requirement for that patient is 11 uh, cm of water and uh, if your patient is having higher level of pressure requirement then you can split the cpap into bi level cpap suppose your pressure requirement is uh, 15 then you can split uh, to epap of 10 and ipap of 15 that again you have to see at which pressure the apnea got eliminated so that is the therapeutic portion and if your patient has undergone auto cpap level of titration then the obviously in the report they have mentioned a uh, 95 percentile of the pressure requirement for that patient so these are the things that you have to look for in uh, diagnostic and therapeutic portion and one catch is there if your patient is having uh, short sleep latency sleep latency mean uh, if you are going to bed and uh, after what time you are uh, achieving your sleep maybe n1 or n2 if your sleep latency is too small then you might suspect uh, narcolepsy and to conclude you have to go for msl so these are the things that you should look for in a diagnostic or therapeutic portion mahesh may i add a couple of things to what dr yes, definitely sir you are welcome so one is um, uh, as i said uh, it's very important to look into that um, oxygenation um, and the oxygen levels yes sir. because uh, you have uh, two three important parameters that often one looks into one is the nadir saturation or the lowest saturation which dr devas has mentioned that has to be very specifically looked into as is the mean saturation and you have something else which is called the hypoxemic burden that is the time in sleep in which the saturation has been less than 90% now why is it important to look into all these things the lowest saturation is very low actually help is a pointer that that particular patient can develop acute complications of sleep sleep disorder breathing like acute coronary syndrome arrhythmia stroke etc on the other hand if the mean saturation is low is less than 90% and the hypoxemic burden that is the time spent more in the in which the saturation has been less than 90% is quite high that means those particular patients are at more risk of developing chronic complications of sleep disorder breathing like which will only attract hypertension factory hypertension, factory hypertension yeah. stroke other conditions like that so that is the importance of looking into it the right. other thing regarding the heart rate as he said the lowest heart rate is important as is the highest heart rate this is what we call the tachybrady oscillation that the heart rate varying between like going to less than 50 and going above 100 so presence of tachybrady oscillation again indicates that the cardiovascular system is highly unstable so that is about the diagnosis study apart from whatever dr devas has said 
One more point in titration. When you do a titration, it's very important to ensure that all the events are abolished, both in spine as well as REM sleep. So that is what you call an ideal or a very good and properly done titration. Optimal titration. So that okay. is maybe the advantage of this level one polysomnography. In level one polysomnography, obviously you can know that my patient has achieved the REM sleep. And uh, it's also in supine rim, the patient has achieved. That is the advantage of level one polysomnography and manual titration. Yes, I would just want to add one point. Uh, the one is the positional AHI. That is also very important to always look on the supine lateral position because that would help in the positional therapy. And yes. always look for the central component. What proportion of patient having a central amperia component because that may require a different sort of treatment in compared to patient who having a uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So that two points need to be taken care. So in the one the question often asked in uh, practical examination, what is treatment emergent central sleep apnea? In titration person, we often see that uh, after over titrating a pressure. Suppose your pressure requirement is around seven to eight. But you are for obstructive sleep apnea, but you are over titrating the patient to a pressure of nine. So obviously at that time, patient developed central sleep apnea due to the hypocapnia. That need to be uh, consideration while uh, going for this manual titration. If your central sleep apnea appears after eliminating all the obstructive sleep apnea. So in that case, your pressure requirement is a bit low. You have to decrease the pressure rather than increasing the further pressure. A couple of more points, Mahesh. Um, one is the other thing is that you also have to look into the duration of the longest event. Yes, Which again sir. is an indicator that the patient has a severe, a severe disease. Actually, the AHI might be very low, but if the longest event is about 100 seconds or 120 seconds, then that patient is yeah, really liable to develop complications. Fair One fair. more thing is uh, looking into the sleep architecture, which is easily um, picked up from these studies. Because we see that many patients with severe um, as OSA have, uh, do not have REM sleep at all. They don't go into REM at all. So when they are treated, actually, they develop a phenomenon which is called REM rebound. So, which might manifest as vivid dreams when they started on CPAP. So, these are certain other things which you can pick up from a sleep uh, polysomnography report. Sir, uh, sir, one point I, I want to add, those patients who have COPD patients, they are chronically deprived of sleep. So, whenever in acute exacerbation, we are putting the patient in NIV. So, this patient uh, uh, undergone prolonged REM sleep and REM sleep precipitated hypoventilation. That elevates the carbon dioxide level. That matters should be taken into consideration while putting NIV to a COPD patient because uh, REM sleep always precipitated hypoventilation. Uh, so that thing should be taken into account. Okay. So this is a very good discussion about the polysomnography. Uh, two points I would like to mention here. Uh, sometimes an uh, examiner may carry a one uh, a photo of epoch and they may ask you which kind of sleep is and uh, means one of the most peculiar they uh, can ask is about the K-complexes. So just yes, do uh, read about the K-complexes and just have a visual uh, impression of how the K-complexes look on the EPO. Uh, second thing, uh, the normal uh, um, RDI in uh, adults is uh, 5. However, uh, in pediatrics, uh, any HI or RDI more than or equal to 2 what? is suggestive of OSA that you are supposed to know. In children, uh, central sleep apnea, uh, one or two central sleep apnea may be normal, but any obstructive sleep apnea is abnormal in children. Yes. Uh, my next question also is... Also one for... point, in the, in the home sleep apnea, it is denominator is total recording time. So that you need to remember, but yes. in level one, it is a total sleep time. <laughs> so that also very important point, I think, yes, uh, yes. the resident need to remember. Yeah. So whenever you are, uh, anyone is given a sleep report, uh, just uh, read a uh, little history if it is available and go through the different different points which Devasis sir, Arjun sir and Dipendra sir has mentioned so that you can come to a conclusion with a proper analysis. And that would really create a good impression on the examiner that you can, you know, uh, in depth about the sleep disorders. Uh, so my next question is for uh, uh, P. Arjun sir. Sir, uh, uh, what are the various types of PAP devices and what are the indications? So uh, the various types of PAP devices, basically we know we have, I think uh, has been discussed in the previous question also. The one, first and foremost type of device that we use is the CPAP, uh, continuous positive airway pressure device. Then you have BiPAP and certain other devices as well. So let us start with the CPAP. Now CPAP basically is used to treat sleep disorder breathing. Basically in, there are two types of CPAP. One is what is called a manual CPAP in which you identify the titration, you do the titration 
find the pressure that is needed to control that particular patient's events and then feed that pressure and that is what the machine gives. The other is what is called an auto CPAP in which the machine itself will identify the pressure requirement and increase and reduce the pressures accordingly. Now, head to head, both manual CPAP and auto CPAP are equally effective. But there are certain indications where you need to use an auto CPAP over a manual CPAP. This should be a few of these conditions should be number one is when there is a higher pressure requirement, more than say more than 15, or if there's a higher fluctuation in pressures. So some people who have allergic rhinitis or some people who rapidly gain weight and lose weight. So in them, the pressure fluctuation will be much more and an automatic machine would be ideally suited for such patients rather than a manual machine. But um, for all practical purposes, a manual CPAP is as, effective, as good as an automatic CPAP. Now, when we come to BiPAP, you have, we know that we have an inspiratory positive airway pressure and an expiratory positive airway pressure. BiPAP basically comes in three different types. You have a spontaneous mode or an S mode, ST mode or a time backup, and then you have a T mode. T mode, we'll just forget that. For our prior discussion today, we will focus only on S mode and ST. By, for all practical purposes, a BiPAP S mode is nothing but a glorified CPAP. So as uh, Dr. Devasi said earlier, if the pressure requirement is much higher, we actually use a BiPAP S mode um, rather than a CPAP because it is uh, patients find it much more comfortable to use a BiPAP S mode. But on the other hand, if you have a, you have a group of conditions where you need a backup rate, for example, an overlap syndrome between COPD and OSA, or the patient has obesity hyperventilation syndrome, all the neuromuscular diseases uh, which present as respiratory failure, um, and all the uh, um, kyphoscoliosis and other skeletal abnormalities. And then, as Dr. Debasi said, you have a condition which is called complex sleep apnea, in which uh, um, uh, sleep emergent central um, treatment emergent central apnea appear. Most of the cases of um, complex sleep apnea get controlled with the CPAP itself within a week, one or two weeks' time. But so if patients still continue to have symptoms or central events, then uh, BiPAP ST mode is always preferred over a CPAP mode for complex sleep apnea. Then um, the other important condition which may be found occasionally is what is called chain strokes respiration where you get it in cardiac failure. So when you have chain strokes respiration, you need a different type of device to tackle it. We conventionally, what has been used for a long period of time is what is called an adaptive servo ventilator or an ASV. So what the ASV does is we know that in chain strokes breathing, there is a waxing and waning pattern of respiration. So the machine actually studies the patient's breathing pattern and supplies a ventilation which is anti-cyclic to the patient's pattern. So when the patient hyperventilates, the machine will reduce the pressure support. And when the patient hyperventilates, actually it increases the pressure support to normalize breathing. So for a long period of time, adaptive servo ventilator was thought to be the treatment for uh, change strokes respiration, um, central sleep apnea. But then now we know that it can actually do more harm in certain group of patients than good. So basically, when you have a patient with change of respiration, the device, PAP device of choice actually depends on the cardiac function of the patient. And when by cardiac function, I mean the ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is more than 45%, the patient can be started on an adaptive servo ventilator. But if the ejection fraction is low, less than 45%, these patients will have actually increased mortality with ASV. So for that group of patients, the PAP of choice is a BiPAP ST mode. Then you have volume assured pressure support devices that are used to increase um, in, uh, case, uh, to you treat cases of alveolar hyperventilation, like obesity hyperventilation syndrome, neuromuscular disease, typhoscoliosis, etc. AVAPS, uh, VAPS technology is supposed to be much superior to the conventional treatment modes. So this is, in a nutshell, the various types of PAP devices that are available. This is very uh, in-depth analysis about the PAP devices, sir. Uh, sir, my next question is uh, for uh, uh, one, thing, one thing I want to add. He, sir has already mentioned in a very beautiful manner uh, what are the devices that you should uh, use in different uh, kind of scenario. But uh, for a patient of obesity hyperventilation syndrome, if we're diagnosing, then uh, we should give a trial of CPAP as we all know that 90% of the OHS are associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So, First time a patient comes to us with OHS, with OSA, we should give a trial of CPAP. If it is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, cure with that of the CPAP therapy, then we can convert it to BiPAP with that of the HTMO. And that's a very important point, uh, Dr. Debashi has said. When you have patients with obesity, hyperventilation syndrome, we find that 90% of patients have some form of, some degree of sleep disorder breathing. And most of these patients will do extremely well with CPAP. There are only 10% of patients who have pure hyperventilation. And yes. it is for those 10% that actually you need a backup rate by parents. 
Mahesh, I would like to interrupt because uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat box. Do we switch over to the next subject or do we answer those first? How would you like to go ahead? I am ready with my next question, oh. whichever you want, but uh, how should we go about? Because Maximum, I think then we deviate for sleep and a lot of questions on sleep are there in the uh, chat box. Uh, uh, Maximum questions are in the chat box are being covered. Okay. Uh, through our discussion. Fine. So I'll, I'll finish with this one, then I'll take the if time permits, then I'll take the questions. Okay, done. So ma'am, uh, next question now, uh, I'll change the mode from uh, sleep to little to uh, drains. So my next question is for you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, um, what are the dif what is the difference between chase drain with trocar and malicot self returning catheter, and in which condition we prefer malicot over chase drain? Okay, thank you for this uh, wonderful question. I have to go back and search actually about malicot's preference over chase drain. Uh, since I did my DNP from a private institute, I had been practicing chase drain with trocar over the time, and. Um, uh, we did prefer, except for a few things. One advantage that Malikot has is it's a self-retaining one because of its flour. The second advantage is the cost. With the current uh, chest strain with Trocar has increased to a cost of more than 1100. The Malikot is in the range of a piece of cheese. Okay, so that's another advantage. And the third advantage is you do not need to do a stitch in the Malikot comparative to the chest strain. While for other everything, I would prefer chest strain with Trocar. We uh, do a minimum, all the respiratory physicians well know it, that we do in a minimum scar and a minimum cut comparative to a surgeon's strain. We had been using earlier to this trocar device with us. You can have uh, anything from a uh, room, uh, bag to the two, two bottle system to a three bottle system. That depends on where you are working, how much easier for you it is to get. And uh, for all the conditions, uh, for the chest strain, this is in addition to your question. One should know, um, earlier they used to say, for pus, put a larger bore and for the air, put a smaller bore. I, uh, this has been off now. We have been using even in the pigtails in the uh, pus conditions. I would still suggest, there was one thing that I learned from one of my very good teachers. Always see the intercostal space size before deciding the size of your ICD. Otherwise, you will rupture the van bundle. So this is an addition. And uh, I honestly speaking, I could not find any uh, where that where is Malikot's preferred over the chest pain. All the other co panelists have learned a lot from you. Thank you for that. Please, if you could add on to this. Thank you. Uh, Malikot's catheter is having a self retaining flower like structure at one end, okay. and it has a okay. rubber. So, this rubber is little bit can create an inflammation, and sometimes it may cause a little lordosis at that area. That is the only advantage okay. which has, apart from it being a very cheap. Yeah, it is definitely cheap. Right. So my next question is for uh, Dipendra Rai, sir. Sir, please uh, enlighten about the criteria other than lights criteria to differentiate bit, uh, between the transudative versus exudative and mention the fallacies of lights criteria. Thank you uh, for this uh, nice question. and. Uh, uh, this is one of the criteria we are using in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and uh, I think the all these dents generally know this slice criteria. They are on the tip of the mouth because uh, they they must know either. Otherwise, <laughs> it would have a bad consequences. So the criteria they are knowing. So the question here, uh, it is good that what are the fallacy of this slice criteria? And, uh, you know, when the light criteria... Uh, came the first time it to get published in 1972 in Annals of Internal Medicine. And uh, it is said that it is almost sensitivity of 98% as specificity of also around 96 to 97%, uh, especially in identifying the exudate. But uh, later on, it may realize that sensitivity part for identifying exudate is okay uh, for the light criteria, but uh, for specificity part is the issue. And it said that it is not 98% specificity, it is around 70 to 73%. What it means that almost one fourth of this uh, exudate are basically falsely classified as exudate on basis of light criteria. So they took the 25% of transudate falsely as exudate. So that is one of the fallacy of this uh, 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 this light criteria. It identified the transudate is okay. 
if once you are getting the trial date there is no confusion but if you are getting the date and you are suspecting clinically or by the all the workup that might this patients look like it is having a some uh, transgenic related pathology or systemic pathology like kidney disease liver disease or cardiac disease and you are getting this uh, exudative then you think that uh, uh, there is some other factor and uh, what could be the factor that lead to transgenic exudative this is uh, said that especially with the ccf cases because the use of the diuretics is change the concentration of protein and that could be the cause for conversion from transudative to exudative so uh, it falsely classified the transudate almost 25% cases as exudate but how we confirm that it is a, it is a actual transudate or not and for that uh, there are some criteria given that uh, you need to look for the serum plural food protein ratio and the serum uh, serum plural food albumin ratio for the protein ratio if it is more than 3.1 or albumin ratio if it is more than 1.2 between serum and plural food it means that you are dealing with a true transudate so that is one of the criteria to just differentiate from true to false uh, exudate and uh, there are some other criteria to uh, differentiate transudate and exudate uh, i have read one of the hafner criteria they have included uh, serum uh, this plural food cholesterol level more than 45 uh, uh, mg per deciliter along with the protein ratio and ldh ratio so they have Uh, use these three uh, uh, parameters to classify the exudate and, and transudate. Uh, I don't know the other criteria. If the other panelists uh, want to add anything in that, thank you. Uh, Life's criteria is a very basic about the plural fit, which can be asked in the exam. Uh, if you uh, mention about the Life's criteria, that's an add-on point. But if you do not mention, then it is a very negative factor for you during the examinations. and one thing to mention about that you should know about the what is a transudate to as sir has mentioned and uh, the, there are two uh, figure to remember if it's albumin gradient more than 1.2 and protein gradient more than uh, 3.1 so when next question uh, is for uh, basically uh, there, just dr mahesh there are basically three type of questions generally uh, examiner expect the one type of question the student must know the one type of question say that good to know and the other question they say nice to know if you are reply that so yes. <laughs> you have to reply this must know answer otherwise it would lead to the bad consequences so this type of students <laughs> keep in mind you can't forget this basic questions uh, yes. answer a bit basic question thank you yes sir so as sir has mentioned lights criteria is must know for all the students So my next question uh, is for uh, Dr. Devasis Behra sir. Uh, on ABG, how do we de uh, determine whether the disturbance is acute or chronic? How do we understand whether the compensation is acute or chronic? Uh, sir, uh, actually our our body is a very beautiful uh, system. So whenever there is some disturbances in the body, the body tries to compensate. So uh, is the case in uh, case of acid base disorder. so basically this compensatory mechanism depends upon severity of the acid base disturbances and our intact organ system so two organ systems are very vital in this uh, arterial uh, acid base uh, compensation disorder one is lung second one is kidney this uh, respiratory compensation occurs quickly maybe around uh, 6 to 24 hours but uh, this uh, renal compensation might take uh, from 1 to 5 days so whether to know a change a compensation or a change is acute or chronic you have to go for the history history is a must from the history you can uh, assume a lot of things suppose you were suspecting a patient of having pulmonary embolism because of the chest pain hemoptosis or dyspnea so in abc you might uh, think that yeah i am suspecting pulmonary embolism so whatever compensation is there that might be due to acute in origin and uh, in other on other scenario if you are suspecting that uh, is a known case of copd who is having worsening cough dyspnea like 3 to 4 days and you are suspecting that it is a case of acute exacerbation of the copd then you can think that yeah the compensation may be chronic if history is not there then obviously you have to look for the change in ph uh, to the change in uh, carbon dioxide or bicarb a lot of formulas are there uh, to know whether it is acute and chronic one simple formula is there that is the change in ph by the change in carbon dioxide if it is less than 0.3 you can uh, uh, tell that it is a chronic in nature if it is more than 0.8 it is acute in nature and regarding compensation whatever what is the compensation value should be that depends upon it is acute or chronic suppose in respiratory acidosis 
there is elevation in carbon dioxide so what we should suspect that the bicarb should change accordingly so in respiratory acidosis if it is acute in nature so 10 mm mercury in uh, rise in pco2 so there is one uh, milliequivalent uh, rise in uh, bicarb level for chronic it is 5 and for respiratory alkalosis it is 2 and 5 so th these are the formulas that you should uh, keep in your mind if someone has given you the abg to draw the conclusion whether the compensation is adequate or inadequate or some mixed disorder is present similarly for metabolic acidosis also the expected pco to some formulas are, formulas are there but the bottom line thing is that we should all know that uh, the compensation never bring back the ph to normal or over compensation whenever you will see over compensation in an abg you should always think some another disorder existing with that of the patient so you should think about another disorder whenever you will see an over compensation inside an abg so these are various steps of abc uh, diagnosis starting from this uh, validity up to the double and triple disorder so you should uh, look into this kind of factors while reading the abc that is very well mentioned sir uh, the two things to remember here acute and chronic the for the acute the numbers to remember is 1 and 5 for chronic it is 2 and 5 5 so uh, my next uh, question is for imma choudhary ma'am Uh, what are the causes for low glucose in pleural effusion and causes for eosinophilic pleural effusion? Okay, so uh, basically to understand why would we have decrease in glucose in the pleural fluid that we are collecting in the effusion? There are two causes. One is there is thickened pleura that is not allowing the diffusion to happen, and the second is there is something in the pleural fluid which is having increased metabolic activity and it is consuming the glucose. So if you learn by this method you will be able to understand what are the reasons so basically when we used to learn we used to think three main causes one is uh, empyema the second is ra and the third is malignancy but when we uh, i was searching more for this question i could find actually there are seven causes so para pneumonic effusions malignant effusion tubercular effusion rheumatoid arthritis as i told hemothorax in addition paragonemiasis in addition And uh, your eosinophilic granulomatous uh, polyangitis or the Turk stress. These are the seven main ones where you can have low glucose. For the eosinophilic effusions, you have malignancy, idiopathic, and para pneumonic as the main ones in all the studies that have happened. In addition, you can have tuberculosis. You can have in uh, pulmonary embolism. Now, in addition to this, I have learned from a lot of uh, cases. which were discussed in one of the nccp meets your parasitic infections can lead to bilateral or unilateral eosinophilic effusions so i mentioned uh, the ones with decreased glucose and the ones with more eosinophilia okay that's all uh, many times uh, uh, people means examiners can ask the question uh, how would be the pleural fluid in rheumatoid arthritis so when should be prepared for that so my next question uh, my next question is for uh, arjun sir uh, what are the various methods of uh, reversibility on spirometry and what parameters to label a significant reversibility see uh, when we say um, actually yeah, the what i'd like to um, state first is that in the latest gina guidelines which was released a couple of days back they have actually replaced the term reversibility with responsiveness it is now called bronchial responsiveness so what basically we mean by that is the rapid improvement in all of these two parameters it is either fev1 or p flow within minutes of giving a short acting beta to agonist protecting bronchodilators bronchodilator so for the classical thing that we often do is when we do a spirometry if there is obstruction uh, you give a bronchodilator and look at the reversibility So how much the CFV1 and the peak flow improves? So if the CFV1 increases more than 12 percent plus 200 ml over pre-bronchodilator, you say good reversibility is present. There are a couple of other things that we need to know here. Number two is um, we usually use a short-acting beta to administer like salbutamol, 200 to 400 micrograms. We can also use ipratropine. 
to look for reversibility. If you are using ipratropium, the dose is 160 micrograms of ipratropium. But the point is that you check for the reversibility after 30 minutes, not the 20 minutes that you suffer after SAR become one. Gino also says that uh, with the spirum, uh, with, the, um, uh, with the looking into the reversibility pattern, you can actually diagnose asthma with confidence if the increase is more than 15% plus 400 ml. So you can actually confidently diagnose asthma based on that alone. Equally important uh, from the exam point of view is that uh, something which can be often asked is if the patient is on a bronchodilator, how, how, when sh should you stop the bronchodilator before the patient is subjected to the spirometry? If the patient is on a short-acting beta-2 agonist like salpitamol, it has to be stopped four hours prior to the spirometry. If the patient is on a twice-daily long-acting beta-2 agonist like formotrol or salmitrol, it has to be stopped 24 hours prior to testing. And if the patient is on a once-daily long-acting ultra lava like India catron, it has to be stopped 36 hours uh, before doing the spirometry. So these are certain important points one should know. Uh, practically, it's important for the exam point of view also. Is. And uh, one more thing for the our students is uh, uh, during the table viva, they can keep all the bronchodilators, respules, uh, MDI, rota caps, as well as the newer bronchodilators. So be prepared with the newer bronchodilators. Uh, my next question is for uh, Dipendra Rai, sir. Uh, is uh, a little off bit now. We are going towards now ATT. How do we modify ATT for drug sensitive TB in case of hepatitis? So I will reply in two parts. So in first part, uh, how do you label the patient as drug induced hepatitis? So uh, there are several criteria given with by the different guidelines WHO, ERS, ATS, they're having a different criteria. Uh, I would combine here. So there is a clinical and biochemical criteria to uh, define drug-induced hepatitis. So in the, all the cases, you need to rule out the viral hepatitis causes. And uh, in the clinical biochemical criteria, it is said that if the liver transmittance is elevated more than five times of this uh, upper level of normal, then you can label the patient as drug-induced hepatitis. In that case, patient may not have a clinical symptom or irrespective of bilirubin level. The second criteria they have given that even the liver transplant is elevated by more than three times or less than five times. In that case, the patient should have some symptoms of hepatitis like uh, nausea, vomiting, or fatigue. So uh, this is the second condition in which you can label the patient as uh, drug-induced hepatitis. And uh, how to treat this drug-induced hepatitis? So, of course, if the patient is having a drug-induced hepatitis, then you need to stop all the hepatotoxic anti-TB drugs like uh, uh, isomerate, rifampicin, and parazinamide. And need to continue with the non-hepatic toxic drugs like ethambutol. You need to add the streptomycin. You need to add the fluoroquinol also. These three drugs should be continued for a week. Do the LFT after one week. If the LFT is normalized, or even the transplantages come to less than two times of this upper level of normal, then you can add the drugs in the sequence of rifampicin, isonegate, and parazinamide. Give for uh, once a week and do the LFT. If the LFT derange, it means that the drug given before that, that is the culprit. Uh, there are some studies so that you can give this uh, one third of the dose, two third, and then you can full the dose. But uh, the, most of the guidelines say that you can start with the full dose. You need to give it just for a week and then you can do the LFT and by doing that, you can identify the culprit. And uh, if the liver, uh, liver function normalized, then you can uh, continue with this uh, four drugs or all the drugs. Thank you. Uh, just to summarize about the ATT and hepatitis as Sarah has mentioned, uh, more than five times without symptoms, stop the drugs. More than three times with the symptoms, stop the drugs. And uh, uh, how do we introduce, uh, there are three things, uh, two things. Uh, start with the one third, two third, and complete drug, or you can start the full dose of the drug. Uh, sometimes, in cases of severe hepatitis, there can be derangement of INR. Then, in those uh, patients, we cannot go ahead with the streptomycin intramuscular injection. So, if if patient is admitted, the patient can be given a IV amikacin as in replacement to streptomycin. Uh, there is one more school of thought to this thing that if patient is not having the severe form of extra pulmonary tuberculosis, then we can uh, stop the drug for some time. If it is a severe form of extra, uh, uh, if it is a severe form of extra pulmonary tuberculosis, then preferably you should be starting the patient on hepatocyte regimen. That is uh, aminoglycoside, uh, 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 and uh, My next uh, question is for uh, Arjun sir. Uh, 
what is the role of peak flow meter in asthma because peak flow is many times been kept as a spot in exam so please uh, throw light on the peak flow meter thanks mahesh peak flow meter actually um, is something which is um, often asked in the examination uh, in the uh, viva in the part of the instruments when we talk about the peak flow meter there are many many uses to the peak flow meter number one is basically it is a tool which is used for monitoring asthma control so there are many ways i can talk about it it can have a short term monitoring as well as a long term monitoring short term monitoring is what basically we do in an emergency room and the patient comes with an acute attack to know whether the patient is improving or not and long term monitoring is what we are based the patient to take the readings in the morning and evening and looking into the peak flow variability so that is one use of um, the peak flow meter the other thing is it is a part and parcel of the written asthma treatment plan that the patient has been given so the patient is asked to monitor the peak flow at home uh, if the patient is on the preventive medications and when the patient finds that the peak flow the patient starts developing symptoms and there is a drop in peak flow more than 50% or 60% then it, mean, it means that there is an imminent exacerbation going to happen so here the patient has to increase the role of you know, increase the preventive medications and if need be take oral steroids also and then uh, um, go for medical attention that is one part of it the other important aspect of peak uh, use of peak flow meter is to demonstrate variability variability is a very important aspect of diagnosis of asthma you can look into variability in various ways uh, one is as we talked about the reversibility the other is the peak flow variability you chart the peak look into the peak flow and find that the variability is more than 10% in adults you say that the patient has asthma and that is one of the ways of looking into it the impo- a new thing which has happened as regards peak flow meter is now we have what is called the who has a program called the pen or the pen program which is the package of essential non communicable diseases and in that peak flow meter is now being regarded as one of the most essential tools for diagnosis of asthma and copd in resource limited settings low middle income group countries so this what the who says that if there is more than you know, or 20 or then or 20% increase in peak flow after you give a short acting beta to agonist that actually helps you make a diagnosis of uh, asthma if the patient if you do not have access to a spirometer and they also say they also say that you can use this to differentiate between asthma and copd although it might be a bit controversial but at least in the clinical conditions this can be used as a surrogate for spirometer and increase in spirometer and peak flow values four weeks after giving an inhaled steroid or one week after giving a course of oral corticosteroid again helps us clinch a diagnosis of asthma uh in the patient has to be started up front on treatment without having um without having if you don't have an access to do a spirometry so these are the various um, ways in which a spir- peak flow meter can be used in the obstructive airway diseases uh, so uh, sir you have very well mentioned about the peak flow meter so that uh, uh, just to add on to this thing uh, examiners can ask you what are the different reversibilities reversibilities in the pulmonary function in spirometry as per bts ats Uh, sorry as per gina as per ats and what is a good reversibility in peak flow so there are three figures to remember it's a 12% and 200 ml as per the gina it's 15% 400 ml as per the uh, ats it's more than 20% for peak flow meter more than 20% and 60 liter per minute may i add one more point here quickly mahesh uh, and as per the ats guidelines you can actually look into the reversibility in the fcc as well not only in the fcb but more than 12% plus 200 reversibility in fcc is also taken as good reversibility yes uh, so my next question is for uh, imma chaudhary ma'am uh, ma'am uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the uh, plural biopsy needles so uh, name the common plural biopsy needles where is techniques for plural biopsy and indications for taking a plural biopsy so any of the conditions where we have the plural involvement and we do not have a definite answer we need to do the plural biopsy indications being any pleural nodule you are able to see on your cts any effusion which you are not able to find the diagnosis any uh, suspected condition where you feel there can be meds or uh, the answer is not there as a certain part with you all these are indications of pleural biopsies earlier we used to do blind pleural biopsies for which we used to have a uh, two needles a brams and cokes needle now uh, nowadays we are doing image guided biopsy so you can have ultrasound guided by guided biopsies or ct guided biopsies you can even have pet ct guided biopsies okay and uh, you can have further when you are doing pleuroscopy or medical thoracoscopy you can take biopsies at that time this is the third time and the fourth one could be by the surgeons which includes the video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and you can have a biopsy at that time now what is the difference between our two main needles abrams and cokes 
uh, the abrams has two concentric tubes where the forks has three parts so you have one outer cannula the inner curette needle and you have a hollow bevel needle so you need to differentiate between these two uh, any other question or any other thing which i have not covered in this we have the uh, close biopsies image guided fluoroscopy that's indications are told and the two biopsy needles are set okay thanks a uh, bottom line is in a resource limited setting uh, you you can use a uh, plural a closed plural biopsy for undiagnosed exotic pleural effusion and if it is if you have an access to a thoracoscopy then that is nothing like that uh, one thing uh, you should be able to differentiate between uh, 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 abrams needle versus cope's needle what is the advantage of cope's needle over the abrams needle okay and what are the complications the complication bleeding is more with the abrams needle as compared to cope's needle and the other complication is in pneumo and the third thing we should know is nowadays we have the uh, direct guns for the plural biopsy rather than the abrams and the cope and you can have variety of uh, companies coming for that so cope's needle biopsy is the increase yield if it is a usg guided yes it is Uh, so uh, we'll just throw a little light on the antifibrotics. So my uh, next question is for Dipendra Rai sir. Uh, sir, I'll just mention about the uh, common adverse effects of common antifibrotic drugs. So uh, we have a uh, two antifibrotic drugs. One is perfluoridone, and second is nintadenil. Just remember that perfluoridone is associated with the side effect related with the upper GI, but it means that the patient having a more nausea vomiting with perfluoridone. And nintadenib generally associated with lower GI side effect, so there is more diarrhea with this nintadenib. So almost half of the patient having a diarrhea with nintadenib, and almost one third of the peripheral patients having nausea and vomiting. Uh, both the drugs are associated with uh, hepatitis or drug-induced hepatitis, so, so you need to monitor the liver function test during the uh, treatment phase. One side effect uh, of peripheral generally asked the examiners that is a photosensitivity. and there is occurrence of a skin rash especially after exposure to sun and uh, it is also recommended that whenever you are giving perfluoridone you should always advise the patients to wear the full sleeve so that there will be less exposure to sun and there will be less uh, occurrence of the skin rash uh, other side effects are not very common uh, like uh, it is said that there is some patient having a poor concentration with the perfluoridones so uh, otherwise all other side effects are not very important and the general exams you don't ask but just remember that perfluoridone with the upper gi and nentrin with the lower gi and hepatitis with the both and photosensitivity and skin rash with perfluoridone only so lower okay. concentration would be post covid effect rather than perfluoridone <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So, uh, so do do read about the antifibrotics, perfluoridone and nintadenib. Uh, what are the different trials related to it? Okay. So do read about the little uh, some of the trials of interstitial lung disease like Panther trial, capacity one, capacity two, etc. So uh, my today's uh, last uh, question is for uh, Devasis Vera sir. Uh, uh, sir, which uh, medicines have a possible role in sleep medicine, and what are their indications? So uh, in the treatment part, uh, basically the treatment of uh, this uh, obstructive sleep apnea mainly can be done by three things. That is, one is uh, positive airway pressure therapy. Arjun sir has beautifully described the positive airway pressure therapy, so I am not going into the detail of this positive airway pressure therapy. Uh, but the problem of this positive airway pressure therapy is that regarding the poor compliance to the patient, people uh, stop the uh, start using it uh, uh, after one month. So in those cases, we have to shift for other options. like surgery oral appliances surgery we generally prefer uh, like when there is some anatomical fist obstruction is there and oral appliances when there is some bony abnormality like retrognathia small maxilla or mandible in those kind of cases uh, we generally prefer oral appliances so the bottom line thing is that the treatment of uh, this sdrb is mainly includes these three things positive airway pressure therapy surgery and oral appliances regarding drugs we generally give these uh, weight promoting agents like uh, modafinil or modafinil and recently in 2019 recently an approved drug is there solrium fetal so it is used to treat excessive dead rem sleepiness but the point is that we cannot start these drugs up front to a case of obstructive sleep apnea which uh, who is uh, having excessive dead rem sleepiness you have to give a trial of sleep up therapy first if after using sleep up there is residual sleepiness with sleep up uses then you can give trial of this kind of drugs you cannot give sole treatment of this uh, modafinil or armodafinil to a case of excessive dead rem sleepiness 
and regarding other causes like insomnia a number of drugs are there starting from sedative hypnotics melatonin therapy and if it is associated with anxiety or depression then you have to give uh, like anti anxiety and anti depressive drugs like that and in the circadian rhythm disorder you have to give uh, melatonin but in obstructive sleep apnea you have to remember just modafinil and armodafinil being as a weight promoting agent in residual sleepness after using sleep apnea that's it okay uh, we have already uh, overshot our time limit of 9 yes, I, we have uh, this discussion was so engrossing that i could not remember that we have uh, reached up to 9:50 pm so uh, just to simply uh, supervise in a, a, a there was a i had prepared a very uh, uh, elaborate uh, take home points but now because of the short time available i'll just innovate with uh, in a one minute Uh, that clinical history, as uh, earlier uh, in a previous webinar discussed by Dr. Atri, there is a no excuse for clinical history. The main judgment of a student is based upon what is your clinical history and what is your clinical presentation skill. Table viva instrument and drugs is an accessory thing. So, uh, and as we uh, know that the, there is no excuse for clinical history. During the COVID times, we saw that how clinical history was important for treating the patients where there was. no probability that we can send patient for various investigations uh, second thing uh, whenever you have been given a abg or a pulmonary function test or uh, sometimes a chest x ray or any other thing uh, always and always ask for what is the clinical history and what is the clinical presentation second thing uh, there are some things which are the must know for every student okay uh, one of which is the uh, abg uh, simple basic spirometry then uh, basic simple chest x ray lights criteria lights criteria is a must know for everyone what are the diagnostic criteria of obstructive sleep apnea you must know that and the most uh, the, the most favorite question of examiners uh, specifically a uh, old timer examiner is tuberculosis so you must know in depth about anti tuberculosis treatment att drugs first line second line do read something about the bedaquilin bipal regimen uh, then uh, zenix trial nix trial which are uh, related to a newer anti tb drugs and read something about the surgical management of in pulmonary medicine uh, then uh, read something related to pregnancy related uh, complications in pulmonary medicine uh, and uh, in instruments you must know about the peak flow meter you must know about icds different types of icds and you must know about the bronchoscope so basic bronchoscopy you must know so uh, uh, as also, we have one point uh, that is very important we know the different type of this inhaler devices mdi dpi what is the steps what is the difference they must know question this is also so yeah. that's so also this, very important this is a good idea sir Uh, uh the different inhalers do re read about the uh, antibiotics specifically inhaled antibiotics att drugs different inhalers nebulizers uh, plus bronchoscope icds and antifibrotics and newer bronchodilators so uh, uh with this uh, i come to an conclusion uh, of our uh, this today's webinar Uh, i really thank uh, dr debasis behra sir uh, dr uh, uh, imma choudhry ma'am uh, dipendra rai sir and dr arjun sir all four of you have contributed immensely to today's webinar and you have given uh, some of the points which even i also did not know so that was really a very good learning experience for me and i think that would be a good learning experience for our all the audience also today um, i Uh, with the conclusion i would like to thank cci for giving all of us an opportunity to be part of this webinar specifically uh, dr uh, nh krishna dr narayana pradipa uh, dr narendra dr ravi dosi and i cannot forget dr chinnam chetty who is a website coordinator also i really thank all the audience for taking part in this webinar i am seeing that there are more than 60 70 question but because of the paucity of time i am not able to cover Uh, uh your question so my apologies for that and uh, thank you our technical team uh, with this i come to uh, an end of this webinar thank you very much it was a Good pleasure being part of the webinar thank you we did learn we did indeed learn a lot too thank you uh, uh, any questions
student comes across they can share on the cci i'll take the help of all the panelists and i'll come back with an answer to your queries so uh, feel free to share your questions on cci platform sir we can share our uh, mail also they can mail us regarding any question is there they can mail us yes yes sure i'll share on mail ids and i'll, I'll try to uh, answer all the questions which are unanswered uh, on cci on cci platform thank you thank you thank you okay thank you